Um, all right, so where were we? We uh, just um, saw the mean value theorem. And let me show to you the um, last we were working on. We did this theorem over here. And this is the one where you may remember it, the diagram to remember is that we have some differentiable smooth function and the property we care about is that uh, sorry, not my best picture let me make something more with more curviness where we can appreciate it Maybe something like this all right so what it says is that there is going to be some slope uh, of a tangent line between a and b which is parallel to the segment AB. And in this case, there's several, right? So there's one here and another one over there. So here's a point that works. This is our point C that works. All right. And um, so we, we went over the proof of this uh, last time. And today we're gonna start by talking about some corollaries of these. So specifically, we have this little corollary. Let me show you on the book. Two of them, actually. We're starting with this one, corollary 5.3.3. It says that uh, if we have a differentiable function and we know that the derivative is zero on some interval, then we can uh, prove that the function is constant. Right? Yeah, so that's uh, kind of neat. Is uh, essentially like the uh, the the converse of something we already knew right so we already know that if we have a constant function if we take the derivative we get zero so this is like the opposite the converse of that and uh, of course this is going to be very useful and relevant when we get uh, to talk about integration right when we, take, when, uh, we start talking about integration this is the opposite of taking derivatives this would be relevant this is telling us that if a function has zero derivative, then it has to be a constant on that interval. So let's go over the proof of this corollary. And it's actually quite simple. All we need to do really is apply the mean value theorem. So let's go back to the page. So how do we prove this corollary? Okay, so here's, this is what we do. So remember, our assumption is that G, of, uh, G prime of x equals zero for every x in A, where A is an interval. All right, so all we need to do is uh, pick uh, two numbers in A, and we're gonna show that the G function on them is the same. So let x and y the elements in A. All right. Then uh, the function is differentiable on A, right? And because it's differentiable, it's continuous. So the mean value theorem applies. So by the mean value theorem, there is some C in between X and Y, right? I sort of, I'm assuming that X is less than Y here, such that, such that what? Well, such that the derivative at C is G of X minus G of Y over X minus one, right? So here we're, we'll assume, put it in parentheses here, X is less than Y. Mm -hmm. So we have this, but, but now what? Well, the derivative of this guy is zero. That's what we said, right? So this guy is zero. And uh, x is not equal to y. So this is this, this uh, fraction is well-defined. And if this fraction is zero, that means the top is zero, right? So that means g of x equals g of y. And you know, and this happens for arbitrary two of them, right? Every, any two of them are equal to each other when we use the g uh, value so you can uh, set that equal to the constant and then do compare any other x 
any other element in capital A with this, with Y, and then apply the same thing, and you are going to get that G of that X will be equal to K. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Hence, G of X equals K for all X in K. Right? Remember, this was for arbitrary two elements in A. Mm -hmm. Super easy, right? Should be really, really straightforward. And there's a second part of this corollary, or uh, another corollary, which is the next one we're going to do here. And I'm going to show it to you on the screen in just a moment from the book. So let's go to the book really quickly. Easy for me to then writing it down. And here it is. It says, now imagine that you have two functions, and these two functions, f and g, uh, are differentiable on some interval a, and they have the property that their derivatives are the same. They have the same derivative. And then the conclusion is that if that happens, then one function is equal to the other plus a constant. Kind of like we already sort of expected it from an interval, right? When we do the antiderivative of a function, we know that there's not only one of them, there, that there's many of them. In fact, we know that uh, if we have one and we add a constant, uh, that's another antiderivative. For example, the antiderivative of 2x is x squared, but it's also x squared plus 7, right? Or x squared plus 17. Because when I take the derivative of x squared plus 17, I get 2x. And what this corollary is saying, that these are all of them, that there aren't any others. So at least if your domain is an interval. All right? So let's prove this one. So now the assumption is that the, um, the two functions have the same derivative on A, right? So that's what we're going to do. Assume f prime of x equals g prime of x for every x in A, A and integral. All right. And uh, OK. So how do we know, how do we prove that, the, that uh, one of the functions is a constant plus the other? Well, uh, it's uh, not hard at all. So what we're going to do is um, uh, we're going to uh, use the, uh, the difference. So we're going to create a new function. So consider h of x equals f minus g. Uh, note that h is differentiable on a, right? Because it's the difference of two differentiable functions on a. So that, that part is fine. And more, what is the derivative of h? Well, according to the rules of the derivatives that we learn, is the difference of the derivatives of f and g. But these two are the same, not, not over here, right? f prime equals g prime. So if these two are the same, then this is zero. Oh, but then we can use the previous corollary. The previous corollary said that if the derivative is zero on an interval, then the function is actually constant. Mm -hmm. By previous corollary, h of x equals some constant k for all x in a. And now if you go back to what f and g are, this tells, this tells us that f minus g equals k for all x in a, or what is the same is that f is g plus k. Mm -hmm. Just like we said, so one function is equal to the other plus a constant, right? Now the constant can be negative. It can be any real number. So plus or minus a constant if you want to put it that way. All right, so a uh, couple of neat, very straightforward uh, corollaries, but very important, and they will be relevant uh, when we get into chapter seven and talk about integration, which is going to be our last chapter of the semester. Um, all right, so we uh, need another, uh, we're going to see another version of the mean value theorem. This is the so-called generalized mean value theorem or called cheese mean value theorem. This uh, Augustine Cochi, uh, that guy, man, he did lots and lots of things, right? And so let's uh, look at the statement. 
And we're going to need this version of the mean value theorem uh, to uh, sh uh, look at L'Hopital's rule, which is another one of your favorites from calculus, right? When we have to do limits that we couldn't do because they were zero over zero or infinity over infinity, we love L'Hopital's rule, right? Taking the derivative of the top and the bottom and see if we got a better limit. So to, to, uh, to be able to do that, we need to uh, know this generalized mean value theorem. And this is what it says. It says if, uh, if you have f and g continuous uh, on the closed interval, differentiable on the open interval a, b, then there is a point uh, c that satisfies this um, kind of like neat symmetrical expression, right? You have f of a minus uh, f of a, f of b minus f of a, so the difference of the f's times the derivative at this point c on the g equals to the difference in the g's times the derivative of the f at that point c, right? And maybe it's better if you take a look at that last line. It says if g prime is never zero. This see this is important because if g prime is zero, then you cannot divide by g prime. But if you can divide by g prime then uh, instead of writing it this way, you can write it like this, which is a little bit better, right? It tells you that there is some C that has this property, that F prime C over G prime of C is F of B minus F of A over G of B minus G of A. Okay, so let's uh, prove this one. So this will be the proof of theorem 5.3.4. And um, it's not considerably harder than the mean value theorem. In fact, in case you didn't suspect it already, we're going to use the mean value theorem to prove this. Okay, so let me start by writing my assumptions. Uh, so we have that f and g are continuous on a, b and differentiable on a b. So similarly to the previous one, what we're going to do is we're going to consider an auxiliary function. So here it is. This is really the trick. So we're going to consider this function, which will be, and it's, if you're wondering where, where how do you get it, well, look at it and you'll see that it sort of mimics what we want. So really the hardest part here is to figure out what kind of result you wanted in the first place. Once you knew what kind of result, then coming up with this function is actually not that hard, right? So it's just a linear combination of f and g. So this is a constant, right? And that's also a constant. So we're just um, a constant times g minus another constant times f. So this is obviously a continuous function, right? And differentiable, so it, it inherits the properties of the previous ones. So this is uh, clearly H is continuous on AB and differentiable on AB. All right. Um, now what? Well, now I'm going to apply the mean value theorem to this function h, right? The regular mean value theorem. So by mean value theorem, what happens? There is some c in the open interval a, b, such that, here we go, h prime of c is h of b minus h of a over b minus a, right? Okay, now what is h of b? That's all we need to do now. Now go back to our functions f and g. So here's the h, and if we plug b, right, what do we get? So h of b is going to be, well look, some things will cancel. Maybe I'll write it. Okay, so let's write. So it will be f of b minus f of a times g of b minus g of b minus g of a times f of b. 
that's just h of b. Then minus h of a, so that's going to be minus f of b minus f of a times g of a, and then plus, because it's minus times minus, g of b minus g of a times f of a. All of that divided by b minus a. Ooh. Okay, now let's uh, figure out the things that cancel. Look, over here we're going to have f of b times g of b, and over here minus g of b times f of b. So this term is going to cancel with this term, right? What else do we have? The same thing here. We have uh, negative f of a g of a with this negative it will be positive so this term will cancel with this one g of a f of a all right so what else is left so let's figure out what what we have left we write it here h prime c equals let's write like like this one over b minus a now let's see we have negative f of a g of b then minus minus that's positive g of a f of b then minus f of b g of a and over here plus g of b f of a and if you were anticipating it you were right look at this so this guy is the same as that one when they have opposite signs and this guy is the same as this guy and they have opposite signs so all of these actually gives me zero all right so this h prime of c is zero we have uh we found a point with zero derivative so what is the meaning of that well that's on the one hand, right? But on the other hand, we could have calculated the derivative of h. So what is the derivative of h? So on the other hand, and I know you can barely see, but I want to uh, be able to look at this expression, right? On the other hand, what is the derivative of h? Well, this is a constant, so we'll leave it like that. Times g prime minus that's a constant times f prime so what is it that we just found we just found uh, a c such that when we plug it here we have we get zero so this is what we have we have f of v minus f of a times g prime of c minus g of b minus g of a times f prime of c that's equal to zero which means this equals that and that was what we wanted in the first place right so i'll just write it here i.e f of v minus f of a times g prime of c equals g of v minus g of a times f prime of c and that's it all right. Uh, questions. So all of these are pretty. Um, they they're all done in essence the same way, right? I mean, you just consider the appropriate function and you apply the mean value theorem. That's what we've done in all these past three uh, problems. Okay. So now uh, let's let's get to uh, see what it applies to, and. This is now uh, Lopita's rule. So let's take a look at Lopita's rule. And Lopita's rule. Um, interesting historical note here, in case you didn't know it, by the way. So it was not, uh, Lopita was not the person that created Lopita's rule, in case you didn't know it. It was known to the Bernoulli brothers before, probably to some other people even before them, but uh, L'Hopital was the one that uh, published a book, sort of like a calculus textbook, one of the first ones. And because it was the first time that this rule appeared in print, then people started referring it uh, to as L'Hopital's rule and the name stuck. Okay, and interesting. So we're uh, on, I'm gonna only going to do the zero over zero case. The infinity over infinity case is in the book too. You can read it. 
but it's just more or less the same idea with a little bit more of a technicality, mostly stemming from the fact that we really did, didn't properly define what it means for a limit to be equal to infinity. I mean, we have an idea that we rose without bound, and we could, but we never really got to specify it with epsilons and deltas and all that. So instead, I want to concentrate on this one, the zero over zero case. So let's read it first, so see we, what, what it says. So what is it that we need? We have two continuous functions, that's important, on an interval uh, around A. And we know that F and G have derivatives with the possible exception of A. So maybe the derivatives exist everywhere, but not at A, so that's okay. Mm -hmm. And what else? Well, if, um, if f of a equals g of a equals zero, so that means when you try to do the limit, when you try to do the regular limit, you plug a top and bottom and you get zero over zero, right? That's what it says. And you know that the derivative of g is not zero for x's near a, then uh, if the limit of the derivatives equals L, then the limit that we wanted in the first place equals L. And that's the way we use it, right? So we want to do a limit. We check that it's zero over zero. We see that our functions have derivatives. So we take the derivatives and then we try to do the new limit. And if the new limit, we can do it and we get some number, then A, that's the answer to the original one, right? That's how it works. And as you can see here, it says, uh, the proof is straightforward and it's actually one of your homework problems. So since uh, today I feel like doing lots and lots of things, I'm like, uh, let's do it, right? Let's actually do this. So let's do exercise 5.3.11, meaning let's prove this. Let's prove L'Hopital's rule, all right? So here we go. So this will be the proof of theorem. Uh, 5.3.6. L'Hopital's rule, the zero over zero case. Let's do it. Good. So what is it that we need to assume? Let's write down uh, the things that we need to know. So we're going to assume this limit that f prime over g prime exists. So f prime over g prime equals f. With f of a equals g of a equals zero and g prime of x is not zero for all x not equal to a mm -hmm. all right so now what well now here's the thing we are going to use the fact that uh, f and g are continuous so we're going to pick some uh, value t greater than a first so consider t greater than a and the interval a to t, right? And then uh, obviously by assumption, so because we're not using uh, the endpoint a, right? So uh, the functions both f and g will be differentiable in the open interval. So note that f and g first are continuous on on a t and differentiable on the open interval right remember the derivative may not exist at a we we know that right the derivatives of f and g may not exist at a but that doesn't matter, the limit is what, what we care about, right? So what happens when we get close to A? So this is fine. Uh, and this is great because now we can apply the generalized mean value theorem, right? So what, what does that one say? So by the generalized mean value theorem, there is some C in the open interval AT such that this one, this line on, on the top, right? This line on the top happens. Now I'm gonna re rewrite this line on the top, but actually I'm also gonna use this, the fact that the derivative is not zero. Because the derivative is not zero, 
I can divide by g prime of c and then divide by that. Mm -hmm. So I can write this as follows. I can write it as f prime of c over g prime of c. So divided this by that is the same as f b f of b minus f of a over g of b minus g of a. All right. Uh, Oh, not B. Was, we're not doing the interval A, B, right? It was supposed to be T. T over here. My bad. Right? Well, moving along. What else do we know? Well, we know that F of A equals G of A equals zero. So we're doing the case zero over zero. So these two numbers are zero. So this is really F of T over G of T. Right? And... That's awesome because now I can use this to figure out the limit because that's what we wanted in the first place, right? So what's going to be the limit when P approaches A? So then the limit of T of G of T when T approaches A. Now remember, I picked T greater than A. So if you want, you can put when T approaches A from the right, yes? Well, that's going to be the limit when P approaches A of F prime of C over G prime of C. But remember that C is between A and T, right? So when T approaches A, then C approaches A, right? And if C approaches A, then this is actually the same as the limit when C approaches A which is this one over here, right? When something approaches A, the quotient of the derivatives is L. So the limit we wanted it when T approaches A from the right is L. So with values greater than A. Okay, so all I need to do to finish the proof is to repeat the same argument, this time by doing T less than A. All right, so this same argument, I'm just going to write this can be repeated if t is less than a by considering the interval t to a plus the limit when t approaches a from the left is also l and if from the right and from the left are the same, that means uh, the overall limit is n. And that's the proof of Lopita's rule, in case you've never seen it before, right? You certainly, I'm pretty sure you used it all the time. Okay, so let's um, take a quick, uh, let's start, stop right here and so this is going this is going to be the end of section 5.3 and i wanted to uh so i was uh, originally when i planned the semester uh i had uh, mixed feelings about this next section 5.4 because last semester when i covered it it was hard and and i i don't think i got the um i was successful at portraying how nice that uh, that section is. Uh, and uh, given that we somehow have more time this semester, given the circumstances, because that we, we have the lectures on the days that we have tests available to us, uh, I, I thought it was instructive that I'll give it another go. And well, I would like to go over uh, 5.4, uh, section 5.4. After all, this is the... Uh, you know, the logo of our class, if you've ever wondered about um, the little picture we have on our Canvas page of this, you know, weird uh, graph of some function is, uh, is what I want to uh, talk about for the rest of today's lecture. So this is uh, the last section of chapter five. And as you may remember, all these last sections are supposed to be exploratory. So um, they have like an outline and a bunch of exercises so that you can discover on your own what it is about. 
and it's usually a nice, uh, you know, challenging, uh, a bit, a bit harder, right, kind of uh, problem. And in this case, it's something that definitely all of you as math majors should know about. Okay, so we're gonna do uh, 5.4, and 5.4 is about uh, constructing a a function which is going to be continuous. So you know you can in theory draw it without lifting the pencil from the paper but it won't be differentiable anywhere so it won't have a derivative at all at any point so it will be continuous but not differentiable all right and i actually took the time to uh, prepare a few slides to help us out and i also have some um uh, pictures that I want to show you on mathematics to understand this all right so we're gonna do this hopefully we'll finish today if not we'll do a little bit next time as well so this is what we want to do we want to do a continuous want to create a continuous nowhere differentiable function that's what we're setting up to do and here's going to be our building block our building block is going to be this uh what the book calls a sawtooth function uh, h of x and you can define it this way right this is how we actually sort of discovered how if you wanted a formula for this function but right now you see it like this is kind of mysterious what is this function and it's uh, way simpler than that so i don't want to give the wrong impression that this is a difficult function so i'm gonna present to you an alternative um quicker way to to know what this function is all right and i'll show you the graph probably if i show you the graph then you'll you'll understand it quite well but here's a better way to think of this function all right so imagine that you have uh some x and x has its integer part so it's some integer plus its fractional part right so for example, if X is 3.7, the A would be three and the T will be 0.7. Uh, another example, if X is pi, then the A would be three, right? That's the integer part of pi. And the T will be 0 0.14159265358979322, et cetera, right? The rest of the decimal digits of, of pi. And this is what this function H does, very simple. If if the integer part is even, you just uh, cut the integer part and you're just left with the rational, with the fractional part. So h of x is simply t. And if the integer part is off, then uh, you do one minus t, right? You do uh, um, one minus t. And as you can tell, this is always positive. That's an important thing to know. It's always positive, the answer of the h function. And it's always a number between zero and one. All right? So let's, let's do a few examples on the page. So let's write it like, uh, like that first. I'm gonna write, so h of x is t if a is even, and one minus t if a is off. And let's try so remember x equals a plus t with a an integer and a t a number that is between zero and one, not including one, All right? So let's, let's do a few examples just to understand. So I just wrote what the h is here and let's, uh, let's try a few. For example, what is h of pi? Well, we know pi, let me write it over here, is three plus, and then 0 0.1415926, etc. Right? So, or in other words, if you want it precisely, is 3 plus 5 minus 3. Right? That's how we write. And uh, 3 is odd. So h of pi should be 1 minus t. So this should be 1 minus 0 0.1415926, etc. Or if you want it really precise, this t is actually pi minus 3. So it's 1 minus pi minus 3. In other words, 4 minus pi. Right? Okay, I picked a difficult one to begin with. Let's, let's, let's do another one. 
let's do uh, how about the age of um, one third? What would be age of one third? Okay, let's see the chat. Hold on a sec. Zero and uh, three, three. Say again. Zero and the three, three, three. One third would be uh, one third, right? Oh. So you, you write one third is just zero. The integer part is zero. Zero is even. So h of one third is just one third, right? That's it. How about h of um, eight sevenths? Well, eight sevenths, we can write it as one plus one seven. So this time now one uh, is odd, and this is the so this is, should be one minus one seven. So that's six sevenths, right? Let's try a negative number. How about h of negative two point three? Well, this is like h of negative three plus point seven, correct? So negative three is odd, so sh we should do one minus t. This is one minus 0.7, so it's 0.3. All right, is that clear? So just a few examples. Now let me go back and show you actually a, a the graph. Maybe you get it better from the graph. So here is uh, the graph. And you see now how easy this is and why it's called the sawtooth function. So this is the graph, right? So think about it. If you are between zero and one, if your number is between zero and one, then you're, uh, it, it's equal to its fractional part. So the x is zero. So it's just the identity line. And then if you are between one and two, then you do one minus t, which is this line, right, with the, the slope negative one. And with this slope of negative one, you, uh, you go from one to two. And then it repeats itself because it just changes from even to odd, right? From even to odd, you just take the, the negative or the positive part, right? So it's this sawtooth function, right? It's up, down, up, down with straight pieces of line. That's what this h function is, right? Uh, it reminds me a little bit of the sine and the cosine functions, but sine and cosine are actually smooth. And this one is like robotic, right? That, 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 that. But uh, that's what it is, this sawtooth function. And actually, in case you were wondering, uh, the first example of these uh, nowhere differentiable functions actually was created with cosine and sine. So, uh, but I think it's easier to understand it with this type of function h, okay? So this is going to be our building block. This is obviously not the function that is um, continuous, but not differentiable. This guy, all right, it has a few points where it's not differentiable right now, right? So the corner points, zero, one, two, three, et cetera, those are not differentiable, but all others are, right? The derivative is one, negative one, one, negative one by pieces, right? So this is not the one we want. We're gonna use this as our building block, right? And we're gonna need more of these so we're also gonna need these uh, guys, right? The hn function. So let me explain what the hn function is. So you're uh, multiplying x by two to the n, right? You're multiplying x by two to the n, and then you're dividing by two to the n. So when you divide by two to the n, instead of going from zero to one, like we were going, so if you divide by two, now you're gonna go from zero to one half. If you divide by by two square by four, then you're gonna go from one uh, from zero to one four, or from zero to one eight, and so on, right? Powers of two. So the heights are gonna become smaller, way smaller, by by a half of the previous one, half of the previous one, half of the previous one. That's the height. This first part over here. But the the when you multiply by two to the n. What you are doing is you're making it oscillate faster. So we're doing two things at the same time. We're making the oscillations smaller by a factor of two to the n, and we're making the oscillations faster by that same factor of two to the n. 
okay? So the graph that you see right now on the screen is H2. So you can tell that H2 now only goes all the way to 0.25, only goes all the way to 1.4, uh, but it goes up and down more times, right? The previous one we had went up and down only once between zero and two. And now between zero and two, this one is going up and down four times because we multiplied by two squared by four. That's why we're going up and down four times. Is that clear? I'm gonna show you more graphs. Uh, I have a little script that I wrote in Mathematica. Where is it? Uh, here. And it lets you see many, many more. So here's uh, the first one. This is the original H function. It goes up, down, up, down, right? I uh, wrapped it from zero to four, so you can see. Now on top of this, so you can see what's going on. On top of this, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna now show you H1. So H1 is gonna go now all the way to one half, but it's gonna go up and down twice as fast. Here it is, you see it? So now it goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, right? And at half the height. Notice how it overlaps with H on this part at the beginning, right? There's some overlap here and then another overlap here, and another overlap here, and another overlap here, right? So that's our function H1. Um, now, if I go H2, is this one. So now it's up, down, 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 right? That's the one that I show you on the, on the slides. Then here's the next one, right? And then the one after that, and the one after that, and the one after that, and then you don't see it anymore, right? I would need to zoom to show you anymore right i mean now this one from here to here is already going up down up down up down up down uh, um, 64 times from, from zero to two and then from two to four another 64 times right that's a lot of ups and downs and now its height is super tiny mm -hmm. all right is that clear what are these functions h uh, two to the n times x divided by two to the n r because those are the ones we're gonna use them, all right? Uh, so here's how we're gonna use them. What we're going to do is we're gonna add all of these, right? So we're gonna add all of them from zero to infinity, all of these little triangles. And that's going to be our, our function. That's going to be our candidate for our function, which is going to be continuous, but not differentiable at all. Here is what I mean. So we're gonna add all of these h sub n functions from zero to infinity, and which is which are these ones over here, right? H of two to the n times x divided by two to the n. We're adding all of them from zero to infinity. And when you do, it's gonna, uh, the graph looks like this. And this is the graph of the function that we're talking about. It's continuous. You can see that it is continuous, right? It's sort of, you can sort of trace it with uh, your pencil if you wanted to, but it's not differentiable. The derivative doesn't exist at any point. I mean, some of them are kind of clear, like here at one, it seems like a corner point, right? And uh, also this guy over here, and this guy over here, and this guy. So there are some that look like obvious corner points, but in some other parts that we can't tell. We cannot really tell from looking just at the graph, right? We're gonna have to be able to, you know, show it precisely, you know, prove it. Mm -hmm. So this is this is our function, and it's a very it's it's I'm only showing it from zero to two, but uh, after two it is periodic. So the same thing starts from two to four and then from four to six and so on. Because all my functions are periodic, right? So if you wanted to, we could only study from zero to two and that would be enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's uh, look at more pictures, uh, try to understand how this is constructed. So I'm gonna show you uh, again some um, animations here with Mathematica. So here is the graph that I just showed you on the, on the, um, let me make it a little bigger, 
on the screen, on the slides. And what I'm gonna do is take it back. So that's the one with six iterations. So I'm gonna take it back to the very beginning. All right, so here's the very, very beginning. Uh, no, here's the very, very beginning. All right, so remember what we're doing. We're adding the H functions. So right now I'm gonna do the first step. When you add H, that's the blue one, with H1, H1 is the orange one, right? We're adding the blue and the orange, all right? So when you add the blue and the orange, you get the green one. This green one is what happens when you add the blue and the orange. So that's what, that's what happens when you only add two of them, right? See, obviously this one is not, doesn't have the properties we want. Uh, I know, you don't need to tell me that, right? Here, uh, the derivative exists all over the place, right? It's zero here, and I don't know what it is here. It looks like negative two, and it's two over here. And the only points that don't have derivative are zero, one half, one and a half, and two, all right? So that's not the one. We need to take it all the way to infinity for the non-derivative uh, uh, thing to work. But this is just to show you how it looks like. Now let's do the next iteration. So for the next iteration, now we want to, uh, so now we have this blue one, right? That's where we were, the blue one. And now we're gonna add the next H function. The next H function are, is this little orange one, this little orange one. And when you add those two, you get the green one, right? So you add the blue and the orange right here, you go to the green. You add the blue and the orange, you go to this green over here. It's supposed to be connected here. I don't know exactly what Mathematica is doing. So this is a connected here. And then down, down, over here, and over here, right? So the green one right now, this is when we added three of them. So, so far we have added three. We have added H, H1, and H2. H, by the way, is H0. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the next one. So now we have the blue one. And we're adding this little orange one. And now the one you get is this green one. All right. And I'm gonna keep it going. So then we, you add these little orange ones and then you get this new green one. And something that you can tell is that every time we add another level of orange ones, of H, we get more corner points, right? You can at least appreciate that, that we're getting more and more corner points. But we still have uh, these other pieces of straight line segments, right? So it's not clear right now that the derivative will not exist. And that happens when you take it to, to infinity. So that's the next one. We uh, have uh, now five of them, and then six of them, and then seven. And at some point you're not gonna see the blue and the green are all, all, almost gonna look the same because the things that we're adding now are super tiny. And that's how I created the picture that I showed you before, right? I mean, your, your eyes cannot look at the little detail here, right? Now we can, we can zoom if you wanted to, right? So I, right now I already did nine levels. So we've added nine levels of this graph. And let's actually look a little bit closer to say one. So let's look around one. So at around one, so let me go from point nine to 1.1 and see how it looks over there. Did I not change? Okay, and maybe we can also change the Y. We want to go higher, only look say higher than 0.6, look, zoom appropriately, right? That's what we're doing. All right, so that's, that's how it looks, near one, so far, right? And now it, looks, it starts to look a little bit curvy, right? Because of these iterations. It's not really curvy, like we were saying, right? It's made up, but this is, obviously there is no derivative right here at one. It looks like a corner point. And this also looks like a corner point and this one and that one, right? There's a bunch here that look like corner points, but not so clear for the others, all right? 
So that's, that's what we want to do now. We want to uh, prove, we want to, I want to convince you guys thoroughly this function is first continuous and uh, that it is not differential. All right, so that's what we're gonna be doing now. Beginning with, hey, is it even well-defined, right? Because we're defining this function as a series. First thing we should check is that it's actually converging. Otherwise, and maybe cheating, right? Maybe this, is, this function is not even defined. So here's back to our slides. And so this is the first uh, thing we should check. And it's one of your exercises, like I was telling, right? So it says, fix a real number, argue that this series converges, and thus the function g is well-defined. All right, so let's do that. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, we, I'm gonna write what the g is. The g is the sum from zero to infinity, one over two to the n, h of two to the n, x. And we want to show this, this is, we wanna show that this is convergent. Right, and I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do more than that. I'm gonna show you that this is in fact absolutely convergent, okay? So we will show absolute convergence, right? And remember, we, we proved before that if something is absolutely convergent, then it is convergent, right? Absolutely convergent is strong, right? So let's do absolutely convergent. So we need to do this. And well, actually it's, it's really the same here because this is positive, right? And here's the key thing, right? The only thing I'm gonna use is that the H function, the H function is always a number between zero and one, right? So the most it can be is one. So this is actually upper bounded by one. And this is a geometric series. This one converges, it converges to, uh, this is equal to two, right? It's a geometric series. So uh, because this series upper bounds that one, then uh, by the comparison test, this one converges. Mm -hmm. Thus, by comparison test, this converges. No matter what x you give me, right? All right, so that's the first thing. So I, I'm not cheating you. This, a, this g function is well-defined. It's correctly defined, okay? So, so that's step number one. Next. Um, let's go back to our, our slides. So we're, we're done with this exercise. No, that wasn't too bad. Kind of easy, actually. All right, so uh, next we want to show that this function is continuous. And I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna show more. We're gonna show that it's not only continuous, it's uniformly continuous in the entire set of real numbers. Right, that's not, should not be surprising because it's um, periodic. If you have a function which is continuous and periodic, then you can find a closed interval and then that closed interval, because it's compact, it will be uniformly continuous. And because that closed interval repeats all over the place by periodicity, then it will be uniformly continuous in the entire set of real numbers. So it's not that big of a deal to, uh, to say uniformly continuous, it's just easier. It's gonna be easier to prove uniformly continuous than, than the other one. But before we do that, I want to uh, show you a little lemma that uh, it's gonna be useful. We're gonna use it for many, not only for continuity, but we're gonna use it for, uh, for uh, some of the other proofs for where the derivative doesn't exist. And this is the, what this useful lemma is. Um, it turns out that the following happens. So I want to uh, see what happens when I take the difference of the h function. That's what I want to know. What is the difference of the h function? So over here you can see h of x minus h of y. What is the difference of that? And I want to consider two cases. The first one is when both a, a, x and y have the same integer part. 
What happens if both of them have the same integer part? And what happens if they don't have the same integer part, but almost? So the integer part of y is one bigger than the integer part of x, right? So um, if you want to know why I'm uh, looking at this is uh, eventually I'm going to need to know what happens with the h function with two numbers that are close to each other. And if they are close to each other, closer than one, then uh, two things can happen. Either they have the same integer part or if they don't have the same integer part, that means it's because there's only one integer in between them. And that's the second case here, all right? And uh, okay, so that motivates why I want to look at this. But look at the answer. The answer is what is pretty. In the first case, the difference is either x minus y or y minus x, depending on whether the integer part is even or odd. So you get x minus y or y minus x. And uh, in particular, you know, if you put absolute value, you get x minus y absolute value in both cases, right? For the second case, I don't get something as pretty. The answer is now x plus y minus 2a in absolute value. But the important thing to know is that that number is less than or equal x minus y. Mm -hmm. So the difference is still smaller than x minus y. And that's going to be important later on. Okay, so let's uh, start by proving this lemma. So let's do the first case, uh, the first part first. So imagine that x and y are numbers between a and a plus one. And I want to know what is x of x minus h of one. All right, that's what we want to do. We go back to the page. So this is what we have. Um, x and y are between one integer and another, right? And let's remember how we defined uh, the better way we thought of defining the h. We said that, so imagine that x is a plus tx. So a plus, and that's the, that's the fractional part. So where t is between zero and one. And y is a plus ty zero and one, all right? And then this will be easy. What is h of x minus h of y? Well, remember the definition of our function, let me put it back and bring it uh, back from our screen. Here's, re let me recall what the definition was. Here it is. Um, if a is even, just do t. And if A is off, do one minus T. All right, as easy as that. So let's do the case where A is even. So first, if A is even. So if A is even, H of X will be TX. And H of Y will be T1. And that's if A is even. And if A is odd, then it's the other way around. Then H of X is one minus TX. And H of Y is one minus T1. And this is if A is odd, right? Now notice that this is exactly X minus Y. And here the ones cancel and what we got is ty minus tx, which is, well, y minus x. And that's it. That's a, that's a lemma, the first part of my lemma. Easy, right? Straightforward. So the difference of h of x minus h of y when the numbers are between a and a plus one is simply x minus y. If a is even or y minus x if a is even. That's it. Okay, now let's do the other case. So for the other case, it's a little bit more elaborated. So for the other case, let's go back to, um, to the presentation. So we can see the um, assumptions. So here's, here's what we have. For this one, a minus one, less than or equal x, less than a, less than or equal y, less than a plus one and the same thing. So now X is 
a minus one plus dx, and y is a plus dy. With this little t, t values always between zero and one. And again, this time we wanna look at the absolute value of x, h minus y. We don't want to be that precise, okay? So, this is what we have. Let's copy our assumptions here. And x, I'm writing it as its integer part plus a little more something. And y is integer part plus a little something, okay? So, let's now try to calculate this difference. So, what is this difference? So, it's going to be two cases where a is even and when a is odd. So, let's do the case when a is even first. So when a is even, uh, we have the h of x is going to be tx. And h of y is going to be, uh, so my bad, sorry, let's go back. When a is even, when a is even, a minus one is odd. So h of x is actually one minus tx minus and a is even, so h of y is just t1. So you will get one minus tx minus t1. And that's when a is even. When a is odd, when a is odd, a minus one is even. So then h of x is just tx. And h of y, a, this guy is odd, so h of y is one minus t1. Okay, all right. And uh, now it's just a matter of substituting the tx and the ty to get it back to x and y, all right? I'll do it here. So what is tx? tx is x minus, uh, x minus a plus one. And what is ty? ty is y minus a. All right, and when you substitute it, the one and the negative one go away. So you got negative x, negative y, and one a and another a, y, I said y, but I wrote x, negative x, negative y, plus two a. And over here, tx is x minus a minus one, and then minus one minus, and ty is y minus a, and in here you get x plus y, positive one, negative one cancel, and then we have negative i, negative a, so negative two. All right, so in both cases we get the same thing, only here it's, uh, I mean, not the same thing, but if you do absolute value, so I didn't put the absolute value, right? You put absolute value is, you need absolute value bars here, absolute value bars here, an absolute value bar here, and now they're the same. Now it doesn't matter if it's even or odd because they're the same, right? So we have that part. Let me go back to our statement. This is what we wanted, right? X plus Y minus 2A. Perfect, we have that. And then I, maybe I just convince you that this is true, that this number is less than or equal X minus Y. Um, by the way, here x minus y is actually y minus x because by assumption y is bigger than x, right? So last part is, last part, why is it true that x plus y minus 2a is less than or equal y minus x? And let me show you the screen. So this is the only thing that we're missing. Well, this is equivalent to, uh, if you do x plus y minus 2a less than or equal y minus x and bigger than minus y minus x, right? So the absolute value is less than some number if it's between the number and the negative of the number. And now I'm just gonna convince you that this is correct. This is negative y plus x. Okay, this one over here, you can cancel the y's. The x goes that way, and it says 2x less than or equal 2a, or x less than or equal a. And this one, the cancel the x's, 
the 2a comes this way, the y comes that way, so this is 2a less than or equal to, to y, so a less than or equal to y. Now, are these two correct? And the answer is yes, go back to the top, and you'll see that x was smaller than a, and y was greater than or equal a. So, these are correct and correct. So because these two are correct, then this one is correct, therefore this one is correct. Okay? So that's the end of that uh, other inequality there. Good? Uh, questions so far? How do we prove that the function is uniformly continuous? And I think that's going to be the only, so we're, we're not going to be able to do the differentiability today, but let's at least do the, the why is this function continuous, all right? So here we go, proof. So what is it that we, uh, I'm gonna write here what we want. We want for every epsilon, there is some delta such that for every x and y, if x minus y is less than delta, then g of x minus g of y is less than epsilon, okay? That is what we want. This part over here. So someone gives me an epsilon and I come up with a delta. That delta is going to work for any pair of, of numbers. And if those two numbers are close, then the g function will be closer than epsilon. That's, that's what we're going to do, right? So how do we start? Well, we start with an epsilon. So let epsilon greater than zero be arbitrary. All right, now I, I, I wish I could tell you how you could come up with the delta um, and uh, spend more time with this, but it's a little bit technical and I just want to you know, show that it is continuous. To me, the interesting part is not the continuity um, because after all, at every stage that we constructed and the pictures that I just showed you, it's a continuous function. So it sort of seems natural that in the end, the limit will be continuous. So the, the continuity to me is not that surprising. The non-differentiability, that's what blows my mind. So here, this is what I'm gonna do. So um, um, there is some m integer, positive integer as a matter of fact, such that this happens, m plus four over two to the m is less than epsilon, right? You can always find an integer like this. So you give me an epsilon, doesn't matter how small your epsilon is, I can find an m that makes this happen. And that's because two to the m is way, uh, rows way faster than m plus four. So this goes to zero, right? So I, wanna get, I don't wanna get into the details of this, but you should realize that this is this is obviously possible. And then what I'm going to, my delta will be one over two to the n. So first figure out what m makes this work. And then with that m, you, you find the delta, all right? So now let's check that it works. How do we check that it works? Well, we suppose that we have two numbers that are within delta uh, of each other. So suppose that two numbers x and y are closer than delta. So remember, this is one over two to the n. Mm -hmm. All right, so then the following happens. If you have an n that is kind of small, so between zero and m minus one, I'm gonna multiply these by two to the n. So I multiply by two to the n, and that's going to be less than two to the n divided by two to the n, right? But remember, my n is small. My n is smaller than m minus one. So this is smaller than two to the m minus one over two to the m, and that's one half. And that's the point that is important to me here. So I just show you, uh, this argues that these two numbers are close. 
these two numbers, 2 to the nx and 2 to the ny, are less than one half, the difference between. Okay, so that's going to be important because then what that means is that when I look at their integer parts, because they are really, really close, then their integer parts are either the same or one, uh, one of difference one, just like we had on the lemma, right? Let me write it here. So we either have A, that's the interior part, the same for both, or, or one of them is smaller than A and the other is bigger than A. Or vice versa, because right here I am come I can kinda assuming that y is bigger than x. But maybe flipping x and y, right? I just don't want to write, right? So those are my possibilities. So th that's not really what I care about. What I care about is then uh, the lemma, right? What did the lemma say? Let's go back to the lemma. Uh, the lemma said that when we have either of those two situations the h function is either absolute value of x minus y the difference of the h's is either x minus y or less than or equal x minus y okay that's what i'm going to use so uh, in either case in either case this is what we have the difference of the h functions is less than or equal the difference of the values all right and that's what i really care about you'll see in a moment why we have two minutes so time to finish this so now let's calculate the g functions of these these two numbers so then what is g of x minus g of y in absolute value here we go. So what is g of x? g of x is by definition a series, this series, from zero to infinity, one over two to the n, h of two to the n x, um, minus from zero to infinity, one over two to the n, h two to the n y. Right? Now this is obviously, we can combine them into a single one, and we can use the triangle inequality And it will look like this. Okay. Now I'm going to divide this, this sum into the, the, the sum that has the small values. Because remember, I want to use this inequality. But this inequality only works for the ends that are between 0 and m minus 1. So I'm going to separate into those two cases. So I just separated this sum into two. The little terms and the rest. Okay, now for the little terms, we're going to use what we just learned, this over here, this inequality. So the h function is at most 2 to the n times x minus y. So this will be less than or equal 1 over 2 to the n, and then is 2 to the n times x minus y. And here, I'm going to use the triangle inequality. So this is at most 1, and this is at most 1. So this difference is at most 2, right? OK. Now you'll notice that this cancels. That's nice. 2 to the n cancels. And you'll also notice that this is, OK, let's continue over here. So this is x minus y. It's a constant. I can take it out. And then it's just the sum of 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 m times. So it's x minus y times n. This one over here is a geometric series, right? I'm going to take the 2 and the 2 to the m. And then it looks like 1 over 2 to the n, but now starting at 0. So it's just a 1 half geometric series. 1, uh, one plus 1 half plus 1 fourth. That, that's actually equal to 2. So this is equal to 2. So we have 4 over 2 to the m. 
All right, and we're almost done because let's remember we wanted x and y, the very top of the page, x and y uh, are less than delta. So x minus y is less than 1 over 2 to the n. Let's put that in. This is less than 1 over 2 to the m times m plus 4 over 2 to the m. So that's m plus 4 over 2 to the m. And, well, let's remember that too, right? That's exactly how we started the proof. So at the very beginning of the proof, this is what we put. We found an m such that m plus 4 over 2 to the m was less than epsilon. Perfect. So this is at the very end, right here. This is less than epsilon. And that's it. Right? For arbitrary two numbers, x and y, if we do g of x minus g of y, that's less than or equal epsilon. Strictly less over here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's it. That uh, finishes the proof. This is uniformly continuous. Uh, next class, we'll, um, on Thursday, we'll finish the part about uh, not being differentiable at any point, right? Which to me is actually quite, quite surprising, okay? So uh, are there any questions before we sign, uh, we sign off? Um, I have a question about the exam date. Go ahead. So since it's on May 1st, does that mean we will get the exam on May 1st and we turn it in on May 2nd? Is that how that works? Uh, is that what I meant or, yeah, let me see. I think I, meant, I think I meant May 1st. Uh, well, either way, I don't know. What do you guys prefer? Um, it doesn't matter. Could be April 30 to May 1st or May 1st to May 2nd. May 3rd is still May, May 1st. 3rd is still what, 1st, maybe? Yeah, I don't, I don't mind either way. And uh, the chapter seven will not be included. So uh, whatever. Seven, eight, second doesn't matter, actually. A lot of people voting professor there. Say it again. A lot of people voting from one till second, from first till second. So that's fine. Okay. Yeah, May sec, submit May second sounds perfectly fine. And it, it can't work fine. So it will be um, an assignment on Canvas, where I will upload the PDF for the exam. And then you can either, um, well, you just need to, you can scan it, you know, work on it. So I'll leave spaces for, for you to work, or you can do it on your own paper and then upload uh, your, your pieces of paper. Um, <laughs> any bonus to take it? Uh, not, well, not really, but, it will make my, my life easier, right? If you type it, then it's easier to read, and then it's better chances that I, um, I grade it um, more favorably to you because I can read everything. But uh, I already had an exam on my calculus class done this way, and people did it very, very well. So uh, even people that made it handwritten, it was neat. Right, of course, I mean, you have 24 hours, so... It's uh, not at all like a regular exam. It was way easier for me to grade. Uh, so uh, I anticipate a similar thing. Mm -hmm. One more question, Professor, about the study guide. Are you going to yes. provide us or this time? I can show you the uh, exam from last semester. Yeah, so that'll from last semester. Yeah, I can do that. I'll, uh, I'll put it up in, uh, by next class. Um, well, I can't promise solutions to that one. Oh, man, wait, wait a second. I think I already have it. Yeah, so I'll post the, uh, the sample, so the actual exam from last semester, and then um, later on next week, I will post the solution. So you, you, you can, I encourage you to try it without knowing the solutions first. Okay? Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. See you guys.